Welcome to uh, CSE 103. This is our Creation Science Evangelism class. So we've already covered uh, much of my videotape seminar on creation, evolution, dinosaurs in the Bible. I taught school 15 years. I don't think I ever taught a class sitting down. This will be my first. You're going to need to sit down for this one. If you're watching this on videotape, this will be very politically incorrect. <clears throat> We're going to cover how the theory of evolution ties in with uh, communism, Marxism, Nazism, racism, uh, the New World Order, coming soon to a city near you. We will discuss some things that I'm sure some people will get upset about. Uh, feel free to call me. I try to document everything I say. I have read mountains of books on this topic. Uh, so this ought to be very interesting on what's coming soon. People are nervous. What's going on in the world? You know, it's just, it just seems like there's a race toward a one-world government. Well, the Bible predicted this would happen 2,000 years ago, and it's happening. We are seeing it now. What we're going to try to cover in this class is what's going on, give you a little historical perspective, and then tell you what you should do about it. Yes, we have a new world order coming. It's going to be evil. It's going to be wicked. Christians are going to be persecuted and killed. Uh, it's coming. What should we do about it? You folks in the military are going to be required to do things that you shouldn't do. What's your decision going to be? So let's get started here. So evolution, Satan's religion to destroy humanity. During the Civil War, a fellow decided he did not want to get involved in the war. The battlefield was moving his way, the battle was, and so he didn't want to get involved. So the guy put on a Yankee coat and rebel pants and decided, now nobody will bother me. They'll think, you know, I'm on both sides. Well, after the war, after the battle, he was found dead with his Yankee coat full of rebel bullets and his rebel pants full of Yankee bullets. <laughs> you better get on one side or the other because somebody's going to lose, right? So, we're going to try to give you the big picture here. About 6,000 years ago, 4,000 B.C. roughly, God created everything in six days. That means he owns it. He's the boss. He's the master. Within the first few hundred years, Satan uh, fell from heaven, apparently. The only reason we say within 100 years is because Adam was 130 when Seth was born. That's the first really date we have to go by. Before that, they had Cain and Abel. No dates are given. Before that, they were kicked out of the garden. And they were kicked out of the garden because Lucifer had deceived them, you know, and talked them into eating the fruit and all that stuff. Actually, he deceived Eve. Adam purposely ate the fruit to save his wife. Uh, it's told, the Bible tells us that in 1 Timothy. So, Lucifer probably fell from heaven about a hundred years after the creation. We know he hadn't fallen during the first week or after the first week because if you look at Genesis 1.31, at the end of chapter 1, God looked at everything and said it's very good. It was not very good if Satan had fallen from heaven and is running around as a bad guy. Plus, there would be no possible way God could say, Adam, you have dominion over the earth if Lucifer already had dominion over the earth. You know? Plus, we know from Ezekiel 28, Lucifer was in Eden until iniquity was found in him. So those are the different clues you can put together and come up with a date of about 100 years after creation when Lucifer decided to rebel. And we'll get into more of that in a minute. So Lucifer wants to be God. And what we're going to discuss in this class, for the next many classes probably, is Satan's attempt to create a one-world government, a new world order, coming soon. So let's try to put it uh, in perspective here. It appears that Satan wants to do at least three things <clears throat> on this planet. Number one, he wants to make mankind wicked, so God will have to destroy them. Satan knows God cannot tolerate sin, and so he's going to try to make everybody wicked and vile, and then God will have to kill them, which is what happened in the flood in the days of Noah. Second thing he wants to do, he wants to keep as, make as many men destroy other men. If he can put it into the head of one fella, hey, I want you to kill everybody else so you can have the whole planet, or so you can have all the gold, or so you can have all the whatever, you know. If people kill people, this ties right into Satan's plan also. And so he's working very hard to accomplish that goal. The third thing he seems to be doing, he wants to keep as many people as possible from hearing the gospel. This would be where repressive regimes like communism come in, where you simply never get an opportunity to hear the gospel because, you know, it's banned in your country. So those type of repressive regimes are part of Satan's plan to keep people from hearing the gospel. Satan has used all kinds of different methods and people to accomplish his goals. As you read through scripture, you'll see different times where there were attempts to make a one world government or a new world order. And we'll get into lots more on that, hopefully, as the class progresses. Um, if he, he knew if he could make man think he was God, then that would create some real serious problems. Because if, if there is no God to tell us what to do, if man is God, then how do you decide right from wrong? Well, 
the toughest man decides. You know, might makes right. Uh, whoever has the biggest gun, you know, he's in charge, <laughs> kind of thing. And so that ties right into Satan's plan also to help destroy humanity and further destroy the world and leads to things like genocide, which we'll get into here during this uh, session. So the problem basically is very simple. We are in the center of the battlefield in the greatest war in history. This is Satan versus God. The battlefield is us. We're in the middle of it. You need, all you need to do is simply decide which side you want to be on, find out what your general wants you to do, and do it. It's just that simple. There's a war going on against God. Henry Morris has a great book called The Long War Against God. And they had an older, the different cover was different before, uh, but now they've changed it to this one, The Long War Against God. And this is one of the books you can read to do a report on for this class. Absolutely one of the best books I've ever read. Henry Morris traces the history of evolutionary thought all through the last 6,000 years. And we're going to concentrate primarily on just the last 200 years on this class, but we'll give you just a quick overview of some of the rest. Christians already have an incredible advantage over anybody else in the world on this topic. When you discuss what's happening and what to do, we've got a book the perfect book, the Bible, that already told us, told us what's going to happen. We already know the end. We know the final result. You see, I read the last chapter and we win. So it's, it's nothing to get nervous about. I get a lot of people come to my seminars when I talk about the New World Order and they, they, they leave nervous. Oh, wow, the world's falling apart. Well, I suppose if you study this kind of topic, you could really get nervous when you study what happened at Waco, what really happened at Waco, like the Waco whitewash, and how um, the, the people were just, you know, murdered at Waco and what the government did. When you study about the Jekyll Island, what happened with the Federal Reserve and how we got a Federal Reserve system, and now we no longer have any money. We have paper we carry around, and we think it's money still. It hasn't been money in 70 years. They've got all the gold, we're carrying around some paper thinking, wow, I got money, and you don't have a dime. They've stolen, they've stolen us, they've robbed us blind. When you get into subjects, uh, Death's Driven, awesome book, The Fourth Reich of the Rich. We can go on and on, and I read lots and lots of books about the New World Order. And it's enough to give, you know, make you nervous, unless you keep in perspective Psalms chapter 2. God is laughing at their plans for toy one world government. So the more I learn about the New World Order, you know, it is, it is tempting to get nervous and scared about what's going on. But like, hey, God knows, and he's not nervous. He's, he's laughing at the whole thing because he knows we win. So keep that in perspective. So if, if you go through part of this class, you may leave going home with scared, nervous, saying, wow, we're falling, the world's falling apart. You know, the sky is falling. What do we do? You know? It'll be fine in the end. Okay, just read the last chapter. We win. So we're going to trace a little bit of the history of this war so you can understand what we should do for our general and relieve your fears about what may happen in the future. God created the world. He owns it. He makes the rules. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs to God, Psalm 24 tells us. So about 6,000 years ago or so, Lucifer decided he should be God. In Ezekiel 8.28, it tells us the story. Thou, talking about Lucifer, was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. I don't claim to understand everything that happened here, how Satan... Uh, rebelled, or what exactly happened in heaven. But it appears that Satan uh, rebelled first, decided he wanted to be God, apparently. His heart was lifted up. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28, 17, The heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee down to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is the best glimpse we have from Scripture of what's going on in the mind of Satan. Five times he said, I will. He's exerting his will. He wants to be God, according to the book of Ezekiel. The next verse tells us, though, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. He's going to lose. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Whenever I read this verse, I think about the Wizard of Oz. You know the movie Wizard of Oz? And everybody is scared stiff of the Oz, you know. And they go in there and you see this huge face and the flames coming out, you know. And uh, the cowardly lion and they all take off running, you know, and dives through the window and the whole thing. At the end of the movie, you find out Oz is nothing but a little bitty, little bitty guy behind the curtain pulling some levers. 
I think at the end of history, we're going to find out Satan is a puny little fella. And we're going to marvel and say, this is the guy that caused all this trouble on the earth? This is him? Come on, you've got to be kidding. We're just going to be amazed at what a wimp he is when he's cast down into hell. Meantime, he's pulling the levers and making the smoke and the fires and the flames and scaring everybody half to death. And people are scared stiff of the devil. Okay, next verse says, This is the man that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house of his prisoners. Now we can talk a long time on this verse. Satan takes people prisoner to different things like drugs, alcohol, and it's tough to get them away. How many people do you know that have died of a habit like that, that they were made a prisoner, some kind of habit, then they, you just can't, can't get them away. Many people get hooked on drugs and they never can get off. You can get hooked on just about anything and get that way. Uh, but while Satan and his followers are making their plans to rule the world, like Pinky and the Brain, how many have seen the cartoon Pinky and the Brain? <laughs> Two mice, they decide they're going to go out and capture the world, you know. <laughs> Every night they've got their plans to go out and we're going we're to destroy the world. That's what Satan's doing, just like Pinky and the Brain. God is up in heaven laughing. Psalms chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Basically that means, I'm throwing off God's control. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God is not nervous, he's not scared, and we don't need to be either. It started on earth. I'm not sure of all the details of how it happened in heaven, but apparently Lucifer fell from heaven, you know, d tried to rebel against God in heaven. He then was cast down to the earth. But he still has access to heaven. He goes back and forth. Job tells us that. Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. But while on earth, the first thing he did was go to Eve. I think that's interesting. He went to Eve, not Adam. Eve is the only one that did not see God create anything. God made Adam, then he put him in the garden, and then God made trees to grow in front of Adam. Now the rest of the world was already full of trees from day three, but here God is making some more trees in chapter two. God also made one more of each of the animals in uh, chapter two. Some people say there's two different accounts and they contradict chapter 1 and chapter 2. That is not true. We'll get into more of that on video number 7 of our series, uh, our regular normal creation series, but it'll probably be two years. This class is going to take a while, I'm afraid, uh, before we get to that. But uh, the, there's no contradiction. Lucifer, or, I'm sorry, God made one more of each animal and some more of each of the plants so that Adam could name them and so that Adam could see that God indeed is the one who's doing the creating. If God had made Adam last, Lucifer could walk up and say, Hey, Adam, how do you like my garden I made here? Hmm. How would Adam know? The uh, fact is, Adam knew because he saw God make some stuff. Now, Eve never did that. Satan came to Eve and tricked her. And then she sinned, disobeyed God. She says, Hey, Adam, you want some of this? Whatever it was, fruit, apple, banana, we don't know. So everybody says apple, but the Bible does not say that. Okay. Um, and Adam looked at it and said, Oh, you numbskull, look what you did. Now we're in trouble. He knew God was going to have to punish his wife, have to kill her. He knew he loved his wife. The only way to save his wife was for him to become sin like her. And now whatever God does, you've got to do it to both of us. So he voluntarily took of the fruit, ate it, knowing full well what he was doing. First Timothy tells us that. And he became sin to save his wife, just like Christ voluntarily became sin to save us on the cross. So in Genesis chapter 3, we see Lucifer whose later name was changed to Satan, uh, deceiving Eve. Now, you need to I need to point out, some of the uh, groups today uh, are teaching that Lucifer is the good God and Jehovah is the bad God. Wow. You get into the Masonic Lodge, you won't find out till you get way up to the top. And they say, you know, we, they pray to God, you won't find out till you get to the... And you may never find out. If they don't think you can handle the information, you'll never be exposed to the fact that Lucifer is God in the Masonic religion. So they'll say, oh, we believe in God? Sure. You believe God answers prayer? Sure we do. And the whole time they're talking about Lucifer. We'll get into it. I'll show you some quotes from their own literature later on in this uh, session on video, what's covered on video number five or CSE 103. Okay. So the serpent, Lucifer, said to the woman, Yea, hath God said... It's interesting. The first thing he did was to raise doubts. This is exactly what the liberal preachers do today. They will try to raise doubts about God's Word. That's what they do with all these new translations of the Bible. How do you know it really says that? It says in my Bible this, and your Bible says this. How do you know who's right? This is the same tactic to raise doubts. 
And we can go off on a long rabbit trail of why the King James over other versions, if you'd like. Uh, we'll cover that later on when we get to what's on our video number seven in our series. And there are people who have, that's, whole, that's their whole ministry. I collect different versions of the Bible. I have probably, I don't know, 25 or 30 or 40 of them, I don't know. But um, there are some serious problems with a lot of the new versions. And I think you'd be real wise to study this topic out before you decide which version of the Bible you're going to study from. I was saved by somebody leading me to the Lord from a Revised Standard Version, or one of the most liberal ones there is. I've led people to the Lord from a Jehovah's Witness Bible. There's enough gospel in there, you can get them saved, okay? You can get them saved out of the Catholic Bible. Okay? It, it can be done. There's still enough gospel left in there, but there are some real serious problems with them, and I think that's a, save that for another time. Um, but the idea of these different translations causes people to doubt. Yea, hath God said. It does that. And this has been Satan's uh, attack on God's word for quite a while. Then the next thing he said to the woman, he said, Ye shall not surely die. He's gone from just raising doubts, hath God said, to denial. So the three steps here are always the same. First, raise doubts. Be a good question, Mara, listen. Raise doubts. Satan works this way. Then, deny. Then, deify. Doubt, deny, and deify man. Next thing he said was, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. Wow, I get to be God? Who would not like to be God? I mean, you get nobody tells you what to do. Like the one kid we had in our school in Illinois, he said, I'm sick of my parents telling me what to do. I'm going to join the Marines. <laughs> Are you brilliant? <laughs> uh, the idea of, you know, everybody would like that, I would think, you know. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm God of the universe, you know. And so, sure enough, uh, that's what the lie was here. He said, ye shall be as gods. Look at the next part, though. Knowing good and evil. What Satan always promises is extra knowledge. You get to know something that nobody else knows. That's what all the secret lodges do. You come to the meeting, you learn something, you hold your hand and you shake hands, you know, you put the second finger right here, the, you know, grab the second knuckle and, you know, you stand like this and you go like this when you're in distress and the judge, if he's a mason, has to help you. And they got all these secret signs and symbols. We'll get into more of that later. But uh, the idea is, you, they think, you know, I know something the average person doesn't know. I have knowledge, you don't, I'm smart, you're dumb. I get this in debates all the time when I debate against professors who believe in evolution. And very frequently they will say something, and I'll have to translate it for the audience. They'll say, well, you know, the average person doesn't understand how technical this debate, this, this topic is. So I'll say, folks, what he means is, he's smart and you're dumb. How many times have you heard me say that in debates? <laughs> That's exactly what they're doing. When the, you see this in letters to the editor or books about evolution, you know, the average person doesn't comprehend, but, you know, now, basically, they're saying, if you don't believe in like we believe, then you're dumb. And Satan always does this. He promises, you know, you follow me and you will have knowledge. The light. That's why he's Lucifer, the light bearer. I will bring you more knowledge, more wisdom, more light. We can go off this beautiful sermon has been preached for years and years on that topic. How Lucifer promises more light, more knowledge. Next verse. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this fellow in the American Humanist said, the turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. The humanist religion teaches man is God. We're it. There is no deity to save us, so we must save ourselves. That's in the Humanist Manifesto. 1933, the first Humanist Manifesto was written, and then the second one came out in 1973. Many famous people that if I listed the names, you would say, wow, I know that one. You know, I know that one. John Dewey, for instance, the guy responsible for the type of education system we have today, a modern public school system with the uh, progressive education, was John Dewey. Uh, and he, he, um, he was one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto. Basically, the idea of humanism is there is no God, and so we must be God. After all, we're the highest evolved creature there is. So we're probably it. And that's the idea behind humanism. So, getting Eve to believe she was God was the beginning of a strategy that Satan would use for the next 6,000 years. This whole idea that man gets to decide right from wrong. Tell me, what is the basis of a democracy? 
man's opinion. The majority decides right from wrong. So when they get together in Congress or in the Senate and they're voting on a law, some people say you can't legislate morality. That's all Congress does all day long. Every law legislates morality. <laughs> There's no such thing as a law that doesn't legislate morality. You're telling somebody else what to do. <laughs> That's what all laws do, okay? So don't give me this, you can't legislate morality stuff. Um, the uh, idea that man decides right from wrong is flawed from the start. Because if, if that's true, if evolution is true, if there is no God, Adolf Hitler was right. He decided, most of our folks here are Aryan, Germans, uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and you know we, we voted that everybody else ought to be killed. Hey, majority decided. What you need is a different standard to say, you know, thus saith the Lord, is how you decide. When I was at the cabinet shop, we had a problem. Uh, we were building real fancy display cases for Gafers and Saks Fifth Avenue and stuff like that. And we had a problem because the, we were building these cases that were curved and they had to go around and end up at the other side and match. But if everyone isn't curved just right, you know, it comes around and it doesn't match. And so here I was in charge of the uh, first department that cut out the wood and put them together. We sent it on to get the lamination and paint and lights put in and stuff like that. Um, and we were having a problem. It wasn't bad, but it was, they were coming off, they were off by, say, you know, half an inch by the time they got around the circle. So I traced the problem down as I racked my brain over it and found out that every person in my department was measuring their pieces as they cut it. The rulers were slightly different. All it needs is an you know, eighth of an inch difference on somebody's ruler from your, you know, his ruler and your ruler. Suppose I told, okay, we're going to get all the guys together in the church and we're going to build a, a, an auditorium. And I'm going to give everybody a tape measure, but every tape measure is vastly different. On some tape measures, this is an inch. On other ones, this is an inch. How's that building going to turn out? Wow. Pretty bad, if it'll turn out at all, right? <laughs> so the idea is you have to have a standard. We have a National Bureau of Standards. They keep a meter stick in a carefully climate-controlled environment, and everybody makes copies of this meter stick. You know, we have, there's a standard meter. There's a standard foot, a standard yard, a standard pound, a standard ounce. You know, you have to have a standard. If you say, how much are you going to give me? Oh, I'll give you a lot. Well, how much is a lot? <laughs> you know? You've got to have some way to measure things, okay? There's standards of everything, for everything. And there needs to be a standard for determining right from wrong, and that's where the Bible comes in. But see, what evolution does, it takes away the Bible, Therefore, there is no more standard. There's no, no longer a standard to decide right from wrong, so the majority of the people get together and vote on what they think is right and wrong. So if they vote, you think abortion's okay? Who thinks abortion's okay? Okay, majority rules. Now, wait a minute. That's why democracies are so dangerous. They never can last. They will always become a dictatorship. And I get real nervous when I hear our leaders in our country saying, we're going to spread democracy around the world. it would be the dumbest thing we could do. We need to spread, spread righteousness around the world, spread godliness, but democracy is a horrible form of government because the majority can simply vote to annihilate the minority. Now, a republic is very different. A constitutional republic is what our founding fathers gave us. We'll get into more of that later. So, scores of people have made attempts to conquer and rule the world down through history. He wanted to use this idea that man can be God, and of course, whoever's in charge is, you know, is God. They, they think they're God. Whoever has you know, the biggest gun or the biggest sword or the biggest club or the most people following him, he's God. Satan caused so many to be wicked in the days of before the flood that God destroyed the world with a flood. God always has his faithful few, though, that disrupt Satan's plans. Here's what happened. God created the world. Satan became proud of his beauty, decided to man should worship him. Satan rebelled against God, and he was cursed. And then he, God said, Someday some seed of the woman is going to bruise your head. That's the first prophecy of the coming Messiah, Genesis 3.15, and there's been a war going on ever since. Here's the prophecy right here. In verse 14, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Satan, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Most Bible scholars interpret this bruising the heel as Christ dying on the cross. A bruise to the heel hurts, but it's seldom fatal. You ever get a stone bruise by stepping on a rock and you, you know you limp around for days afterwards? But it's not fatal. Not many die from a bruise to the heel. Uh, a bruise to the head can be fatal. 
So most people, have, for all of history, have interpreted this passage as Satan's going to be able to bruise the Christ at the cross. He's going to hurt him. But he came back from the dead. And now that seated woman is going to bruise his head. Not over yet. Uh, and the idea of Satan... Satan knows, you know, some seed of the woman is going to bruise my head. It's crush my head. Somebody's going to do me in. So he decided to kill every human being on the planet. He wants to utterly destroy humanity any way he can. Just like when Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus in Bethlehem. He's only after one kid, but he killed them all. Now, Jewish tradition tells us about 22 babies were killed in Bethlehem. Bethlehem's a small town. You know, there weren't a lot of kids under two years old. It wasn't like he killed thousands of people. But, and Herod later did call, get, get called in for that and got in trouble. There's a great book called The Archco Volume that deals with that, about some of the archaeological findings. Have you got to read any of that yet, Eric? That is awesome. I read you the passage about the Christmas, didn't I? And that, that whole thing is uh, about the arch. Anyway, we won't go off track here. So, uh, just like Herod tried to kill all of the kids, he killed them all just to be sure to get the right one, Satan has decided he's going to kill every human being on the planet to try to you know, be sure he gets the right one, to thwart or upset God's plans. Satan decided to destroy every seed of the woman to save his own skin. He knew God could not tolerate sin. So he worked hard to make man sin, so God would have to destroy his own creation, make them corrupt if possible. Genesis 6, 5. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord always has somebody. Remember when the prophet thought he was the only one alive that was serving God? He ran away, you know, from Jezebel and ran for about 100 miles, I believe. And finally stopped under a juniper tree and he's feeling bad, feeling sorry for himself. And the Lord said, hey, uh, Elijah, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed the knee. You're not the only one. And about the time you feel like I'm the only one that loves God, there's a lot of people out there that love God. I'm an independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical Baptist, but I'll be the first one to say there are some Lutherans that love God and some Methodists and some Presbyterians and there are all kinds of denominations where there are folks that really, really love God and are really going to heaven. Now they have to join the Baptist church when they get there, but they do get to go. <laughs> they do get to go to heaven. So, after the flood, Satan got right back to work corrupting people. It didn't take him but a hundred years or so and Nimrod comes along and decides, hey, God said spread out, take over the world. No, we're staying right here. I'm going to lead my kingdom. And he built the Tower of Babel, you know, uh, to get a new world order. Lots of folks have tried this. Tower of Babel, shortly after the flood. Now, the Bible it doesn't tell us when, okay? You can get a few clues together and say probably within the first 200 or 300 years is when the Tower of Babel incident took place. Some people have speculated that when the Bible says in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided, that's talking about divided by languages. Some people think in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided as in they decided, hey, there's so many folks, we better survey the property and see who gets what. Divide the land up. This is your part, this is my part. Let's put up a few fences here or put some borders up, okay? Some people think the continents moved. I don't buy that for a second because if you move a continent six inches, it kills everybody on the world, you know? <laughs> Be a tidal wave, go around the world ten times and kill everybody. So I don't think that's possible. But, you know, some people really hold to that theory that the continents moved away from each other, you know, and that would be, I think, tough to explain physically. There's all kinds of theories. We'll get into more of that later <clears throat> when we get into what's on part, video number six on our uh, Hoven theory about the flood. But Tower of Babel was the first attempt after the flood to create a one world government. Then God divided them up by languages. They spread out, which is probably the best thing ever happened to humanity because you just can't get everybody together to develop a one world government. It's really tough. You know, the language barrier has kept it from happening. So even though, you know, you speak Russian and some people, yeah, and you work with people all day long, speak different languages, I know it's frustrating, but it's probably the best thing God could have done, you know, to keep us from killing ourselves a long time ago. <laughs> there would have been a world dictator a long time ago had it not been for that. So then you have ne ne Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar comes along as the first uh, world ruler to conquer a large chunk of the world. There's an interesting uh, story in the book of Daniel. If you're going to study prophecy, what's going to happen in the future, you really need to start with Daniel 
and then study Revelation. It's like the two books go together. God told Daniel to write this book. When Daniel got done, he said, Lord, what does this mean? The Lord said, Daniel, don't worry about it. Put the pen down. This is for the next... Somebody else will finish this up. And then John comes along on the Isle of Patmos, you know, 2000, what would it, what it be, 600 years later, and finishes the Revelation. And so Daniel and Revelation go together and should be studied together. But here's the story. In Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherein his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Yeah, that'd be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? <clears throat> They all say that. They don't really mean it. <laughs> they will hope he dies so they can be king. <laughs> right. O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. Now, I don't remember the dream. And if ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. In other words, you are in trouble, fellas. Okay? And, of course, you know the story. They couldn't tell the dream, so the king decided to start killing all the wise men. These guys are a bunch of fakes anyway, and they were. And along comes Daniel. Yeah, Daniel's in an unusual situation here. He and 7,000 of his schoolmates had been taken away from their home, taken away from their country. Probably their families were killed. Thousands and thousands were killed. They bring them to Babylon. These kids are all teenagers, 16, 17, 18 years old, roughly. They make them eunuchs. Look that up in the dictionary. Uh, they give them different clothing to wear, get, make them learn a new language, and subject them to slavery. I mean, you have zero authority, zero rights. I mean, you just, what future do you have? Daniel decides, hey, I'm going to make the best of a bad situation. <laughs> I'm going to try to do the best I can. Sometimes you get yourself in a situation where you say, okay, I'm here, what do I do? Let's just do the best with what we got. Other people get in a bad situation, they get falsely accused, they end up in jail, and they get bitter. Some people get better, some get bitter. Uh, Joseph in the Bible is a good example. You know, he's falsely accused by uh, his master's wife. Here he has already been sold by his brothers to be a slave. You know, things aren't going too well for Joseph in life. You know. Ends up in jail for 13 or 17 years. I think he was 17 when he went, and he was in for 13 years, 30 altogether. 13 years in jail for doing nothing wrong. He decided, hey, let's make the best of it. Um, sometimes you just have to get yourself that attitude of, okay, things aren't going well, let's do the best we can. Johnny Erickson Tata, once he was 17 or 18 years old, dove in, <laughs> broke her neck, paralyzed, waist down. Neck down, yeah, neck down. What am I going to do? Well, let's just uh, let's learn how to type and let's write books. All you can do is move your head, you know, put a pencil in your mouth and type. type. Hey, okay, you can get bitter about it if you want, but you might as well get better and let, hey. And she paints, yeah, and has radio program, you know. Sweet, godly spirit. Uh, anyway, so Daniel then comes in and says, Hey, king, I can not only tell you what the dream was, I can tell you what it means. Now, as you read Daniel chapter 2, it's interesting. Uh, Daniel really gives a good testimony for the Lord. He said, it's not in me, O king. The God in heaven who rules everybody, including you, has told me this dream. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the idea of anybody telling him what to do, but uh, Daniel, little Daniel, this eunuch servant boy, is about to tell the king <laughs> a message from God. I love this chapter. We'll take that up after a quick break. Daniel chapter 2. Well, let's take up again here. Let's talk about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what Daniel interpreted for him, uh, and see how it ties into us today. Here's the goal of Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out of the mountain, cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Hmm. So the statue that he saw is basically a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay mixed together. 
This was symbolic of the next five great kingdoms to come on earth. Later on, if you read the book of Daniel, Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold. Now it's interesting, each of these metals, gold, silver, brass, iron, iron and clay, become less valuable. Gold is the most valuable, and Nebuchadnezzar had the most uh, pure form of dictatorship, I guess. I mean, he was, he was the law. Nobody, they didn't vote on anything. All he had to do was decide, I want you to kill that guy right there. Yeah, but I'm going to appeal <laughs> to who? <laughs> to me? <laughs> okay. Well, here's the case again. You're still going to the prison or whatever, you know. Uh, nobody told him what to do. When you get to the arms of silver, you're talking about the Medio Persian Empire, which was the second great world empire. They wanted to rule the world. But they were, the, their king was not an absolute dictator. I mean, they had laws, and he had to abide by the law. And even when the king decided, you know, he was tricked, you know, and they were going to throw Daniel in the lion's den and all this stuff, the king was tricked and bound by his own laws. Nebuchadnezzar never would have been bound by his own laws. He just would simply change his mind. Then you get to the belly and thighs of brass. This is symbolic of the Greece, uh, Greece Empire of Greece, Alexander the Great, uh, who ruled uh, all the known world, and then died at age, what, 30 or 32, and said, oh, I wish I had more kingdoms to conquer. Nobody else to beat up. You know, he got them all. But brass is not near as valuable as silver. Uh, then you get to the legs of iron, and that, notice there are two legs. This most Bible scholars interpret as being the Iron Legions of Rome, which split into the Eastern and Western divisions, one at Rome and one at Constantinople. And then you get to the ten toes on the image's feet, which has iron and clay mixed. Iron and clay don't mix. Partly strong, partly weak. This, almost all Bible scholars will tell you, is symbolic of the next, the last kingdom that the world is going to see, uh, last human kingdom, is going to be a revival of the Roman Empire. Probably something like the European Common Market. You know, ten kingdoms are going to get together, try to give all their power to one person, and it's not going to be very good. It's going to be a dud. Um, the Iron, the Iron Legions of Rome would, would uh, just stomp on anybody who got in their way. They ruled over everybody that opposed them. Uh, the iron and clay mixed together. This final kingdom is going to be weak. A lot of people are really nervous about the, you know, new world order and the, you know, it's it's going to be iron and clay. Okay, it's not going to work. It's going to rule for a short time and be destroyed by the stone cut out without hands. Now that's interesting. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We'll get into more of that later. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, it says, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces. Now remember, the stone cut out from the mountain, we see later, hit the image on the feet and crumbled the entire thing, all the way up to the head. This is Nebuchadnezzar's thinking, Why, that's right, I remember that in the dream. Yeah, that's right, you know. <laughs> he had forgotten the dream and sure didn't know what it meant. All he knew was he woke up scared, you know. So Daniel's telling him the dream and telling him what's it, what it means. Let's keep reading here. Broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, which filled the whole earth. This is going to be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And you can go off into all sorts of rabbit trails here, how some people think that the Great Pyramid is symbolic of this, and Jesus, the, the chief cornerstone was never put in place on the pyramid. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We'll get into more of that later as one of the theories of what this all might be talking about. Then Daniel said, this is the dream. I like that kind of confidence, you know. Hey, I'm just a little 17-year-old kid. I know you're King Nebuchadnezzar, but hey, this is how it is, fella. You know? <laughs> I do that in debates sometimes. I'm thinking, these guys are college professors. They've been teaching this stuff for 30 years, you know. They're a lot smarter than I am. But look, fella, you're wrong. I'm right. <laughs> Period. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hast made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. 
there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Okay, now right here, let's stop. This is an interesting prophecy. When the ten kings get together and try to make their power, their world empire, this is when God's coming back. And he's going to set up his kingdom. So people who study scriptures are getting excited, saying, boy, we must be getting awfully close. Now, the European common market might not even be. It, we might have 500 more years. Okay, what they're attempting to do in Europe with a unified Europe and all this, it may all fall apart. Okay? There have been many attempts at world, world empires before, and they have disintegrated. Um, I would not stick my neck out and say, boy, this, you know, this proves the Lord's coming back you know, tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the, in the morning. You know? I don't have a clue when he's coming, and we might have a long time. If the Jewish calendar is right, the Hebrew calendar, they say this is the year 5760. Well, then we've got, if 6,000 means anything, we've got 240 more years. The one guy wrote a book, you know, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Come in 88. <laughs> well, that was uh, a while ago, you know, <laughs> he missed it. <laughs> then he revised it and had a pamphlet out, 89 Reasons Why the Lord Will Come in 89. And the 89th reason was? I don't remember. Because uh, he didn't come in 88. Was that the 89th reason? <laughs> okay. Um, that's dumb, okay? Don't do that. I don't know when the Lord's coming. I tell people, we figure the Lord's coming back 2,000 years you know, from the birth of Christ. This is the year 2001 now. But, um, the Lord might be, we know our calendar is five or six years off, okay? Not too many folks argue about that. Christ was born in 4, 5, or 6 BC. Um, so our calendar is off for sure. So this is already the year 2007 or 8, okay? So we missed it. So we missed it, yeah. Well, the Lord might be coming back 2,000 years from the resurrection instead of from the birth. I mean, why would we figure from the birth of Christ? Why not from the resurrection? Or why not from the triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Maybe that's the significant. And I tell folks, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or you know, disrupt anybody's book sales on 88 reasons why the Lord will come in 88, but maybe God's not even using your calendar. <laughs> maybe He has His own, okay? So don't sell your clothes and go stand on a mountain and say, okay, the Lord's coming you know, today, now, because <laughs> you might stand there embarrassed. Okay, let's go on here. <clears throat> and in these days shall the King of Heaven, shall the God of Heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God that hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. <laughs> I like that confidence, man. Revelation continues the story. Daniel brought it up through the next five kingdoms, including one that uh, still hasn't happened. The fifth kingdom, we, we assume to be the revival of the Roman Empire. Somehow, these ten people in Europe are going to get together and try to make a kingdom. Dr. Henry Morris has a great book, uh, The Long War Against God, that deals with the history of evolutionary thought from Satan in the Garden of Eden all the way up, including the rise of uh, various different Eastern religions, which really is the same thing. The idea that man gets to be God. It's all part of the same stuff. That's just an awesome book. Uh, we have a few left in hardback, which have the old cover. They're a lot more expensive, but the softback is 13 bucks if you want to get it from our ministry. That's one of the top five or six books I've read in, the, in my life. It's excellent. Okay. Um, so Satan decided, you know, he wants to rule the world. Henry Morris traces this really well through history with different groups of folks that have taught the same basic idea, man gets to be God. So in this uh, class, for the next several classes, we're going to be discussing just the last 200 years, since about the year 1800 until the present. Uh, what, how does evolution tie into the plans toward a new world order? We're going to look at the deadly effects that uh, come about when people believe they are God. And they determine right from wrong. Nobody else tells me what to do. Well, first we're going to review a little bit of what we covered on part four, seminar tape number four, which would have been class uh, CSE 102. Uh, just hit a few highlights and then go right on take it from there. James Hutton in the late 1700s wrote a book near the end of the century saying the earth is millions of years old. Now during this time, most folks thought the earth was 6,000 years old, is what the Bible taught. 
Okay? If you add up the dates in the Bible, you get about 6,000. James Hutton came along and said, I think the earth is much older than that. Now, this was kind of a new idea um, and was rejected by most people. But a lot of Christians began to think, well, man, if the earth is millions of years old, then we need some way to make the Bible say that. So they started compromising the obvious teaching of the Bible and invented the gap theory, the day-age theory, progressive creation, all that kind of stuff. And there are still thousands of some really good Christians who have fallen for that right now. The Dakes Study Bible teaches it. Pastor John Hagee on TV teaches the gap theory. Um, Benny Hinn teaches the gap theory. Uh, it's amazing how many folks teach this. Uh, uh, Billy Graham believes in the gap theory. Now, one lady called me last week and said, Billy Graham, or two weeks ago, and said, Billy Graham's brother, older brother, if you can imagine that, goes to my church. And I gave him your videotapes, and he loves them. And he's going to give them to Brother Billy and uh, get him straightened out on the gap theory. I said, well, yeah, that'd be great, okay? Uh, during the late 1700s, people were, most all nations were ruled by a king. This is called the Age of Monarchy. A monarch is a king. And the kings were ruling by what they said was divine right. You know, God told me to be your king, and so you just do what I say. If you don't like it, that's tough. And a lot of abuses, of course, happen in a system like that. And you can study history from that perspective, and you'll see that people were getting sick of a king claiming he should be their boss just because God told him to, and his son ought to take over. You know, they inherit this right, succeed, you know, father to son to grandson. And so people began rebelling against this idea and started uh, getting rid of the king. So for the next few hundred years, the next 60 or 70 years maybe, there were quite a few revolutions around the world. The American Revolution, threw off King George. The French Revolution, Polish Revolution, the Spanish Revolution, the German Revolution. They got rid of a king, basically. If you study the book of Revelation from this perspective, it appears that God gave the seven churches the same sequence of events that uh, one of them was going to be <clears throat> the Laodiceans. Laodicea means the rule of the people. No longer is the king going to tell them what to do. The people themselves are going to vote on right and wrong. Basically a democracy idea, apparently prophesied in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 about the seven churches. Uh, I don't know how far to carry that. Some, I think, get a little hyper on that topic. Uh, but I think it's an interesting study, okay, the seven churches in Asia. Okay, so anyway, there's a time of anti-monarchy. And since the Bible says to honor the king, some people thought the Bible was an obstacle to their political objectives. And so they were looking for a way to discredit the Bible. So here we have, in the late 1700s, everybody's teaching the earth is a few thousand years old. James Hutton comes along and says, oh no, it's millions of years old. Hmm. Now the Hindu religions were already teaching this. The Eastern religions were teaching the earth is infinitely old. It has, you know, it's always been. It's eternal. James Hutton's book, though, had a very strong influence on a lawyer named Sir Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was a lawyer from Scotland. He hated the Bible. We covered some of that later in last, you know, CSE 102. Charles Lyell developed the geologic column. Now, other people were involved in this. You know, a guy named Steno and uh, Smith and uh, Cuvier and quite a few people. Actually, a lot of Christians were involved in developing this geologic column. A lot of creationists were involved. They were old earth creationists, the Hugh Ross kind of guys, even back then. And the scientists rejected this idea at first. And the church accepted it. Some churches, liberal churches, accepted it. We'll get into more of that later about a guy named Priestley. But uh, he developed this geologic column. And the geologic column can only be found in one place in the world. Who remembers where that is? Text textbooks. Can't find it anywhere else except the textbooks. Uh, F. Sherbert Taylor said, I myself have little doubt that in England it was the long-age uniformitarian geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. So England was a Christian country, sending out missionaries all over the world in the 1700s and eight, early 1800s. I mean, they were the, the Christian uh, nation on earth. They were sending out, you know, uh, missionaries everywhere. And now it's, you know, very little Christianity in England, okay? A good rip-roaring church over there will have 50 people in it. You know, most of them run 15 or 20. I mean, Bible-believing churches do. Very difficult. Same thing in most of the uh, uh, European-type countries. But Charles Lyell wrote his book in 1830. Charles Darwin graduated from Bible College in 1831. 
He set sail on board the Beagle to go around and collect bugs and birds. And Darwin actually argued with some of the sailors in favor of creation and argued against uh, uh, the teaching of the day, which was kind of a pre-evolutionary type teaching. He, he, he tried to convert some of the sailors. The captain on board the ship was a guy named Captain Fitzroy. Uh, Fitzroy was one of those kind of guys that you do it my way or that, you know, my way or the highway, you know, very intolerant of anybody who disagreed on anything. But he and Darwin had very interesting discussions on this topic. Darwin, though, at the same time he's gone this five-year-long voyage, he's reading these books by Charles Lyell. Now, somebody told me as a brand new Christian, uh, gave me advice that somebody else had given years ago. He said, in 10 years, you're going to be the same person you are right now, except for the people you meet and the books you read. Read good books. It'll change you into what you want to be. Read bad books, it'll make you a bad person. Read good books, it'll totally change. You know, The more you read of good stuff, the better off you are. So, Lyle read this book. He said that book changed his life forever. Lyle also read a book by a guy named Thomas Malthus. So I want you to know for the quiz, two people that strongly influenced Charles Darwin. One was Charles Lyle. And the other was a guy named Thomas Malthus. Malthus had written a book in 1790, I think, I don't know, sometime back then. Malthus said, the population grows geometrically. You multiply, you know, 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, you know. Population takes off geometrically. The food supply can only grow arithmetically. 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. See, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, 4 times, you end up with 2, 4, 6, 8. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, you end up with 16, or 30, uh, 64. So, now Malthus was wrong, okay? As the population grows, there are more people available to plow the land. But he's looking at it totally wrong. Malthus affected a lot of people back in those days. Basically, the idea was, look, there's going to be more people born than can possibly survive because the food supply is limited. That was his faulty thinking, but whether he's right or wrong at this point doesn't matter. The fact is, he did influence Charles Darwin. So Darwin thought, well, let's see, if more people are born than can possibly survive, then um, the weakest are going to die off. Nature is going to select the strongest to survive and the weakest to die off. Anybody seen the movie The Christmas Carol? Charles Dickens, every Christmas they play that thing. This was supposedly taking place uh, set in the early or mid-1800s when evolution was a popular theory. And the teachings of Thomas Malthus was still very influential. Remember when uh, the uh, Scrooge was asked the question, what about this person that's going to die, you know? And he said, well, let them die and decrease the surplus population. Remember that phrase in there? And later on, the ghost of Christmas present or one of those, you know, said, he repeated that back to him. Let them die and decrease the surplus population. Well, that is exactly what the thinking of the day was. Are there no workhouses? That's what, that, that was, it's so classically true of that time period because of Malthus's teaching that, uh, you know, the, the, you, everybody can't live. So since everybody can't live, it's best if the weak ones die. Otherwise, the whole population becomes weak. We really ought to have the weak ones die and the strong ones survive. Then the farmer, you know, save the best ones for breeding and, you know, sell off the worst ones. Sure. You want to develop your stock, of, whether it's tomatoes or apples or anything. You know, you say, try to save the best. Uh, so in 1790, James Hutton's book began people on the trip of doubting that the earth is 6,000 years old, which, of course, made them doubt the Bible. A few years later, Charles Lyell comes along and makes people take away the flood. Then along came Charlie Darwin, and he took away the Creator. Now, what we're going to study here is what happened since 1850 when it took about 10 years for evolution thinking to kind of, you know, permeate society. But boy, what happened after that? With the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, it all ties together. And I don't think you can possibly understand the history of the last 150 years and how it's going to affect you today until you see how evolution ties into this. Some people thought, you know, if there is no God and man evolved, then one color of man must be superior to the rest. Which is how? Racism comes in. Now, there's always been racism, okay? People have subjugated other folks because of their skin color. But uh, when you think you're God, then you get to make these kind of decisions. The Bible says clearly we're all descended from one family. There's no reason to be a racist. But uh, evolution would teach 
one race must be superior. Just like this uh, Harold Rafton said, uh, do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes. That supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. American humanist, this guy said, the turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Yep, we're in trouble. <clears throat> I had a student tell me in a public school in Pennsylvania, he said he was an atheist. And I said, well, then how do you tell right from wrong? He said, well, I decide if something's right or wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. What a philosophy. I said, well, son, I'm glad to hear that because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, you can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe. And I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. What's wrong with that thinking? If evolution is true, what's wrong with that thinking? Okay. Nothing. That's the way it goes, right? Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, exactly right. So we're going to study now a little bit about racism and how it ties in with evolution. When we're done with this, we'll go into communism and how it ties in with evolution. Then we'll go into Nazism and how it ties in. And then into the New World Order and how it ties in. It'll probably take us about the next 55 weeks, but we'll work on it here. Here's the Darwin, Charles Darwin's book. Give us the title. The Origin of Species. Now, that is not the entire title to the book. We'll get into the whole title in just a minute. Okay? But almost all the books... If kids today hear about Charles Darwin's book, they're only told the title was The Origin of Species. One thing you need to know for the quiz is the real title to the book coming up next. Now, the evolution theory came out way before Charles Darwin in 1859. Okay? Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, taught the same thing. Erasmus Darwin was a medical doctor. He was so huge, they cut out the table to allow a place for his belly while he ate. He had a special table, custom made, <laughs> cut out, just so he could sit there and eat. But he really came, he rejected God, rejected all sorts of things, and he pretty much wrote most of what Darwin wrote. And most, many people think that Darwin simply plagiarized or stole the work from his grandfather and claimed it as his own. Never gave Grandpa any credit whatsoever. But, uh, Charles Darwin, what he came along at an opportune time for this theory to really be acceptable, whereas 60 years earlier, when Grandpa came up with it, people weren't ready to accept it. There were too many strong Christians still, you know, at the, around 1800. So, he called it the origin of species. <clears throat> now, you've got to be careful when you get into a discussion on creation evolution. The question is not, what is the origin of species? The question is, what is the origin of kinds? The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. It doesn't say they bring forth after their species. For instance, these are all different species of monkeys. But if you stand back and look at it, you should notice one thing. They're all monkeys. It's the same kind of animal, right? I mean, obviously it's not a tomato or a banana or a horse. It's the same kind of animal. Another thing you got to question is, who is deciding what a species is? Who's making this decision anyway? And the evolutionists get all bent out of shape with me because they'll say, we have proven species can be created. I don't question that. Yeah, but have you made a new kind of animal? Like the guy in Indiana. He said, I've got proof for evolution. I said, oh really, what is it? He said, I'm working in the laboratory right now on soybean plants, and we have created soybean plants that are resistant to frost. Totally new species. I said, oh. Uh, that, that'll be handy. I mean, that's good. But uh, what did you start with? So had a soybean plant. I said, oh, what do you have now? A uh, soybean plant. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, sir. That's not a new kind, okay? So you might have decided it's a new species, and I'm proud of you, but that's not a new kind, okay? It's still a, it's still a plant. Um, watch what this textbook does. This is Heath Biology, 91 edition. Darwin published his findings in a book titled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. They still don't give the whole title. Now, back in the 1800s, it was very common for the title of your book to be real long. Today, we try to make them, you know, short. But they had real long titles back in those days. Here is the title from the title page of Charles Darwin's book. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Hmm. Who can tell me? Uh, you need to know the year this book was published, 1859, for a quiz. 
Did, when did the American Civil War start? 1861. So what's going on in America in 1859? Slavery, right? So when this book comes out, those people who are for slavery, of course, are thinking, wow, here's a perfect way to justify what we're doing anyway. Darwin is proving scientifically that one race is superior to another. And of course, since I'm white, I know it's the white people. The black people, of course, thought the blacks were superior. <laughs> the Chinese thought the Chinese were superior. But uh, this book really, now this didn't create racism, okay? But this book coming out in the mid 18 hundreds is like throwing gasoline on a fire. Racism was now justified. Favored races. By the way, back in the old English spelling, oftentimes they put a U in, same with the color, the word color, C-O-L-O-U-R is proper spelling as, as is C-O-L-O-R. The U is sometimes in there for so favored races. This is not a misspelling, that's what they called it back then. Now I want to read some of these books. Uh, Seven Men Who Rule the Grave, Who Rule the World from the Grave, or uh, Fourth Reich of the Rich. Great book by Des Griffin, who lives in Oregon, um, has written extensively about people who want to, you know, control the world and how the philosophies have had such a powerful impact. Charles Darwin's book was Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races. Now even scientists today, like 1998 Encyclopedia, will say Origin of Species was not addressed in 1859 and is still a mystery in 1998. Both the origin of life and the origin of major groups of animals remains unknown. That's quite a confession. Darwin's book was The Origin of Species, but he never did discuss the origin of species. I, I don't know why he called it the book that, you know. It's one of the most boring books you ever read. I've got it if you want to try to read the thing. Uh, absolutely boring. This guy's a lousy author, a lousy scientist, lousy thinker, in my hum humble opinion. Uh, okay. But the idea that there's a favored race, to me, would translate to the fact that we get to become God. You mean I'm the favored race? You mean I'm better than everybody else? Oh. Can you see how this would tie into the same equation? You get to be God. Favored race. Charles Darwin, in his book, showed his philosophy. He said, thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. Now tell me, how, first of all, who's a higher animal? Humans. Yeah, I mean, this, this idea of classifying things in an order of, this one's the, the highest animal and this is the lower form of life. For instance, uh, some people say single-celled creatures like amoeba or paramecium are primitive life forms. There's no such thing as a primitive life form, okay? Actually, they're more complicated because for my body to do what it does, I have all these different systems. 50 trillion cells so that I can eat and digest food, breathe, move around, you know, keep the body warm, etc. Other animals do that in one cell. Yeah, that's pretty complicated. So, the whole idea that there are primitive life forms and advanced life forms, that whole concept is silly. If it's alive, it's complicated. Incredibly complicated. But Darwin's philosophy was that the way you get these higher animals is through suffering, war, misfits, death, cruelty. This goes back to, you know, reflecting what Malthus taught. Only the strongest, really, should survive. That's what's best for the species, okay, if the strongest survive. Darwin thought that natives were just advanced animals. Now back in 1859, we had slavery in our country. Racism was popular. It was accepted. It was still wrong, but it was happening. It could be bought and sold Negroes like slaves. Henry Fairfield Osborne is a name you ought to learn. He was the director, curator of the American Museum of Natural History. He was one of the guys that was going to come in and testify during the Scopes trial and give evidence for evolution. He said, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. Now, if a teacher said that in class today at the University of West Florida, what would happen? He'd shot. <laughs> He'd certainly be fired and probably shot, right? Oh, Jesse. Go get him, wouldn't he? Oh, Jesse Jackson. Uh, 
the guy's a racist. And yet he was one of the strong promoters of evolution back in the 1920s. But most of the museums exist to promote evolution. Many museums were founded by people who believed in evolution and who left behind large chunks of money saying, I want you to start a museum to spread this religion. That's basically what it amounts to. Okay. Thomas Huxley, he's the guy that made Darwin popular. Darwin wrote his book, published it, and went and hid. Huxley went around publicly preaching evolution. Huxley said, no rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior, of the white man. Now keep in mind, he's saying this back in 1871. Civil war is over, slaves are freed. Did that stop racism? 1960s, we still had trouble in this country. Black people sat on the back of the bus, right? Separate bathrooms, separate schools, you know. Segregation. This uh, priest, uh, Priestley said, the black people of Australia, talk about the Aborigines, exactly the same race as the African Negro cannot take in the gospel. All attempts to bring them to a knowledge of the true God have as yet failed utterly. Poor brutes in human shape, they must perish off the face of the earth like brute beasts. You ever see the movie Quigley Down Under? Mm -hmm. They hired this Quigley guy to come in and shoot Australian Aborigines because he thought they were inferior. They're just an animal. I was out, uh, soul, uh, out soul winning one night in uh, Longview, Texas. I had a bus route in an all-black neighborhood. For 17 years, I drove a church bus and picked up black kids and brought them to church. Had a wonderful time. Loved it. Okay? Well, many times, I'd be out there at midnight, the only white guy in the whole c complex, you know. <laughs> a little nervous once in a while, but hey, that really, I had a wonderful time. Loved it. I've brought thousands and thousands of black people to church and to the Lord. Okay, got them saved. But I'm out there. Well, I couldn't sleep one night, so I got up 2 in the morning, drove down to my bus route to go visiting because there's always folks up at 2 in the morning in the black neighborhoods, you know. Uh, and this one guy uh, had got, was drunk. He was turning his car. He thinking, thinking he's going down the road, but he drove down the railroad tracks instead. Turned too soon. He drove about 20 feet, and the rails bottomed out, you know, stopped his car, so he's stuck. And the drunk guy's out there trying to figure out, well, how come my car won't move, you know? So I thought, man, a train's going to come and plaster this guy all over the county. So um, I got out of my car, not on the tracks, and I walked down to help this guy. A couple of other folks stopped, and we went down and tried to push the guy's car backwards. And uh, I got talking to one of the men who stopped to help, and he said, what are you doing out here? This is a dangerous neighborhood. I said, no, this is my bus route. I come here all the time. I know most of these folks. He said, your bus route? I said, yeah, I drive a bus in here from there bringing these folks to church and, you know, tell them about the Lord. He said, these folks are all black. I said, well, not the palms of their hands. <laughs> he said, black folks don't have souls. And that was when? This was uh, Texas. My kids were little, so 20 years ago. I said, black people don't have souls. I said, are you part of the KKK? He said, yeah, how would you know? <laughs> Just a lucky guess. You know? The idea that black people don't have souls is still being taught today, folks. Okay, Racism's not over. Now, Kingsley, Charles Kingsley, was an Anglican priest who promoted Darwin. If it hadn't been for Kingsley talking other Anglican priests and church people into believing in evolution, it probably would have been a dud as a theory. Priestley is the primary guy who got the church people to believing in evolution. So put his name down as a quiz question. Who is the Anglican priest that promoted evolution? The scientists rejected Darwin's idea. You think a people can come from a rock? Yeah, right. Nobody believed that. Priestley got all the church people believing in it. Pretty soon this evolution theory spread around and Charles, I'm sorry, Carl, Charles Kingsley, <laughs> I keep saying Priestley, Kingsley was the Anglican priest who promoted this crazy idea. Back in this time, Africans were bought and sold like slaves. They packed them into ships. Here's an example of how they would loose pack them. The ship was allowed to carry uh, 454 slaves. We had 451 on this voyage. On one uh, voyage, she carried 609. Many times, slaves died on the trip. They just chained them to the deck. You didn't get up. You stayed right there for two weeks. Got to go to the bathroom? Go ahead. 
You're staying right here for two weeks. Many died. When slavery became illegal, or things, sometimes slaving ships would chain them all together, and if they were thought they might get caught, bring them up on board, push them overboard. Drown them all. Just so you don't get caught carrying a cargo of slaves. Uh, here's an example of how they would loose pack them so more would survive. Uh, they honestly considered them like cows or sheep. It's just an animal. They thought they didn't have souls. I don't think you'll understand the slavery of the 1800s until you understand how evolution ties in. One more thought and we'll quit. This is from Creation X Nihilo magazine. Um, a New South Wales missionary was the horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of Aboriginal men, women, and children. Forty-five heads were then boiled down and the ten best skulls were packed off for overseas. They rounded up the Aborigines, shot them, cut their heads off, boiled them to get rid of all the flesh, and sold the skulls to museums for displays on evolution. The Smithsonian right now, I have heard from very reliable sources, has 33,000 sets of human remains in their basement. Many of the displays at colleges were used as evidence for evolution, the shapes of the skulls being slightly different, you know, are from people that died in the last 200 years. Tasmania, uh, south of Australia, I met, I sat by a guy on the airplane a couple weeks ago from Tasmania. Um, the Tasmanian Aborigines were all slaughtered. There isn't one that survived. The last one was killed in 1908. And they took part of his body and made a tobacco pouch out of it for somebody to carry tobacco. Uh, it's unreal what happened. That stuff wouldn't have happened had it not been for the evolution theory. The Bible says all nations are of one blood. And there's no reason to be a racist at all. They thought the Abri Aborigines had not evolved as far, therefore they're just an animal. It's okay to kill them. One of the evidences they used for this was the Aborigines have bigger jaw bones. And they said, wow, see, that proves they used to be a monkey. They're closer to a monkey than we are. We'll get into that next class, okay? How racism ties in. Then we're going to get into communism. And that's going to be very politically incorrect. You may not want to be here for those uh, next few classes. But see you next week. Thank you.